Well, that doomsday clock they talk about was not designed in heaven. There are three fundamental myths about World War II that we've been confronting. The first is that the United States won the war in Europe, when of course it was the Soviets who won the war in Europe. The second is that the Cold War started during World War II because of Soviet aggression. That narrative is completely wrong. But the third is that the atomic bombs ended the Pacific War. The reality, as historians understand, is that the atomic bombs had a minimal impact, whereas the Soviet invasion convinced the Japanese that all that no, there was no chance for, for carrying on any longer. In fact, um, the American intelligence had been saying for months, beginning at least in April, that a Soviet invasion of Manchuria and Japan would lead to complete collapse of the Japanese military. And, and Truman understood this quite well. Truman said he went to Potsdam to make sure that the Soviets were coming into the war. He got Stalin's agreement on July 16th. He writes in his journal, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. He writes home to his wife Bess the next day. Says, the Russians are coming in. We'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the boys who won't be killed. The Americans had broken the Japanese codes. We were intercepting their telegrams. Truman himself refers to the intercepted July 18th telegram as the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Truman knew full well that the Japanese were defeated. They were looking for a way to get out. They were trying to negotiate through the Soviets to help them get better surrender terms. The Soviet invasion, which begins at midnight on August 8th, completely undermines Japan's uh, diplomatic strategy, which was to try to help get the Soviets to help them get better surrender terms, and it undermines Japan's military strategy, which was to wait for the American invasion, inflict heavy casualties, and get better surrender terms that way. Most of the American military leaders are on record as saying that the atomic bombs were not necessary. In fact, six of America's seven five-star admirals and generals who got their fifth star during the war are on record as saying that the atomic bombs were either militarily unnecessary or morally reprehensible, or both in most cases. We're talking about people who weren't pacifists. We're talking about Admiral Leahy, who was the, ch uh, the who chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was Truman's personal chief of staff, Douglas MacArthur. General MacArthur says the Japanese would have surrendered in May and happily if we told them they could keep the emperor. General Dwight Eisenhower, later becomes president, says that the, that the Japanese were defeated. There was no reason to hit them with that damn thing. And I hated to see my country be the first to use it. Chester Nimitz, General King, Hap Arnold, all on record, as well a lot of other military leaders saying that the Japanese were defeated. There was no need to use the atomic bomb. Uh, Leahy says it, we were barbarians in doing so, so we adopted the ethical standards of the barbarians of the Dark Ages. And so, uh, but again, this is a narrative that most Americans are completely unaware of. If you look at the intelligence reports, uh, in April, May, June, July, they made it very clear the Soviet invasion was going to end the war, and the Soviet invasion did. When Prime Minister Suzuki was asked on August 10th why they had to surrender so quickly, he said that the Soviets are already taking Manchuria. They're getting, taking uh, Karafuto. Uh, uh, pretty soon, if it, next they'll be in Hokkaido. If that happens, the foundation of Japan is destroyed. We have to surrender what we can surrender to the Americans. What you have to realize is that the Americans have been firebombing Japanese cities ever since uh, March. We'd, been, we'd wiped out and firebombed over 100 Japanese cities before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Destruction reached 99.5% in the city of Toyama, 99.5%. To the Japanese who had recognized, Japanese leaders accepted that the United States could wipe out Japanese cities. To Japanese leaders, it didn't make a big difference if it was one plane and one bomb or 200 planes and thousands of bombs. They accepted that we could wipe out cities. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were simply two more cities. But the Soviet invasion, as the leaders knew, was changed the equation and forced the Soviet surrender at that point. Most Americans believe that the United States won the war in Europe. That's a pretty crazy notion if you study the war at all.
For Americans, the narrative begins on December 7th, 1941 with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Then there's a brief interlude where we go and, and take out, go on North Africa. We invade North Africa and then the underbelly and go up in Italy uh, and the Mediterranean. And then the real war for Americans starts on June 6, 1944 with the D-Day invasion of Normandy. The reality of the war was that throughout most of the war, the United States and the British were confronting 10 German divisions combined, while the Soviets throughout most of the war were confronting 200 German divisions combined. And it was the Soviets who won the war. Churchill said the Red Army tore the guts out of the Nazi war machine. The Nazis lost about 6 million on the Eastern Front and about 1 million on the Western Front. So, uh, but, and Americans don't know this. Uh, in the Americans lost, well, I asked my student, I did an anonymous survey uh, with college students. These were all A students in high school. And I asked them, how many Americans died in World War II? The median answer I got was 90,000. So there were only 300,000 off. I asked them, how many Soviets died in World War II? The median answer I got was 100,000, which means they were only 27 million off which means that these, these young kids, uh, are, as smart as they might be, have no understanding of what the Cold War was about, have no idea what's going on in Ukraine now. They don't have the historical context to make sense out of that. You know what 27 million represents? After 9-11, the United States lost a little, fewer, a little less than 3,000 people. Uh, the, after which, We've invaded country after country after country, wreaked havoc on the planet to get revenge and find the perpetrators. Uh, nine, 27 million is the equivalent of one 9-11 a day, every day for 24 years. That's what the Soviets suffered in World War II. When President Kennedy said it's the equivalent of the entire United States east of Chicago having been destroyed, he was not exaggerating. The Soviet losses were unimaginable. The horrors of World War II were unimaginable. And of course, as a result, they wanted a buffer zone between themselves and Germany. They'd been invaded twice by Germany through Eastern Europe within the previous 25 years. The main demand that the Soviets had after World War II was a buffer zone. During World War II, they wanted a couple things. One thing was they wanted was a second front. The United States promised, in fact, in, in, June, in May of 1942, President Roosevelt asked, the, uh, so asked Stalin to send over Foreign Minister Molotov and a top Soviet general to come to Washington, D.C. They met with Roosevelt and, and General Marshall, and at that meeting, Roosevelt turns to Marshall and says, can we open up the Second Front before the end of World War II, before the end of 1942? And Marshall says, yes, and Eisenhower says, yes, we should before the end of 1942. The Americans pledged, promised to open up the Second Front. We don't open up the Second Front until June of 1944. That's largely because Churchill refused to go along. So during that time, the Soviets were bled to death on a massive scale. Uh, and then they turn the tide, they defeat the Germans, and then the Germans are retreating ahead of the Red Army, which is pushing toward Berlin. The American narrative then, after that's from June, four, June 6, 44, through the end of the war, the Americans march to Berlin and win the war. That's not what happened. So uh, the, the other uh, myth about the war is that the uh, Soviet Union started the Cold War during World War II because of Soviet aggression and Soviet desire for territorial aggrandizement and the, the whole thing. What the Soviets wanted was a buffer zone. They wanted a buffer zone between themselves and Germany. They did not trust Germany after the war. And, and so the Americans initially had toyed with the idea of the Morgenthau Plan, which was to pastoralize Germany, deindustrialize Germany, never let Germany become a military and industrial power again. But the United States backed off of that, that notion. And, and so we look at, at how the Cold War really begins. Roosevelt's last telegram that he sends to Churchill says that these issues between the US and the Soviets pop up every day and they all get resolved. He said, let's not make a big deal about that. The United States and the Soviets should remain friends in the post-war period. However, Truman becomes president on April 12, 1945. Truman had been vice president for 82 days before that. 
during which time Roosevelt never spoke, spoke to him twice, but never anything of substance. One of the amazing facts of the war is that when Truman became president, he did not even know that the United States was building an atomic bomb. Nobody had high enough regard for Truman to even tell him that the United States was building an atomic bomb. So he, as he becomes president, he's got to confront these major issues, and in my opinion, he gets them all wrong. So he gets advice. The people he gets advice from are the ones who Roosevelt had little regard for, especially when it came to foreign policy. Truman's first day in office, April 13th. He meets with Molotov on April 23rd, 10 days later. By that time, the whole mood of the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union had been flipped. Uh, whereas Roosevelt wanted the United States and the Soviet Union to co collaborate in the post-war period, he actually said to Molotov, what we need in the post-war period are four policemen. The United States, the Soviet Union, Britain, and China will together ensure world peace and stability. Uh, Molotov comes to meet with Truman on April 23rd. Truman accuses him and the Russians of having broken all of their wartime agreements, especially the Yalta agreements, especially over Poland, and, Tru and Molotov is outraged by this, and Molotov says to Truman, I've never been spoken to that way in my life. Truman says, carry out your agreements and you won't be spoken to like that. So Truman accuses the Russians immediately of having broken their agreements, and the reality was that the Soviets were adhering to the Yalta agreements more than the Americans were. Truman's interpretation was wrong. Truman later backs off of that. But at the time, he bragged. He said, I gave it to him one two to the jaw. And so Truman, this little macho guy who, you know, it, but you can trace it back into his actual upbringing. If you know Truman's history, Truman's father was a very small man in Missouri named John Peanuts Truman, who would go around beating up guys a foot taller to show how tough he was. He wanted a macho son. Unfortunately, he had Harry, who was not only not macho, he had to wear these Coke bottle thick, sun, thick glasses. He couldn't play sports with the other kids. He says, I was a sissy, he said, I, was I, was, I had hypometropia, I was afraid my eyeballs would pop out if I did any rough house play. So Truman was the kid in the neighborhood who all the other kids picked on as a kid. They called him Harry, for, they called him sissy, true woman, four eyes. They used to chase him home after school, uh, carrying his books. He'd run home crying. His mother would greet him at the door and say, Harry, don't worry. You were meant to be a girl anyway. So he grew up with all of this gender confusion, and he sees it in, in his letters he writes. He writes a letter proposing to Bess, who used to play third base with the boys while he was running home. And, uh, and he says to Bess, I know you're not interested in me, a guy with spectacles and a girl's mouth. He's always referring to his feminine attributes. But his father wanted a tough macho son. And the tough macho one was Harry's younger brother, Vivian. But Harry was the wimp. But later in life, he's going to stand up to Stalin. He's going to stand up to Churchill. You know, he's, he's going to show how tough he is, win back his father's respect. Uh, and, and so, uh, so Truman says, it says that, that he gave it to him one, two to join. He's always referring in these macho ways to this confrontation with Stalin. The reality of the Cold War and the start of the Cold War is that Truman reversed Roosevelt's policies toward the Soviets. The other person who we have to bring into this story is Henry Wallace, one of the people who has been wiped out of the history books, has been written out of history, erased from history, is one of the most extraordinary Americans in the 20th century. That's Henry Wallace. Roosevelt appointed him Secretary of Agriculture in the New Deal administration in 1933. Arthur Schlesinger later said that Henry Wallace was the best Secretary of Agriculture this country ever had. Well, he turned the poverty of America's farmers into prosperity and into massive production during the war, uh, or before the war, even during the 1930s. When Roosevelt was going to run for a third term in 1940, he knew we were on the verge of a war with, against fascism, and he wanted a leading anti-fascist progressive on the ticket as vice president, and he chose Henry Wallace. The party bosses, however, didn't trust Wallace. Wallace was much too radical for their tastes, and so they opposed putting him on the ticket. Roosevelt wrote a remarkable letter to the Democratic Convention in 1940, 1940, in which he turned down the nomination for the presidency, and he said, we already have one conservative 
money-dominated, Wall Street-dominated party, the Republicans. If the Democrats aren't a liberal progressive party who stand for social justice and the right values, then there's no reason for our party to exist, and I'm not going to run for president on such a, such a ticket. The, Eleanor Roosevelt went to the floor of the convention and convinced them that he was serious, and they gave him Wallace on the ticket as vice president in 1940. Wallace was an extraordinary vice president. In 1941, when Henry Luce declared that the 20th century must be the American century, the United States will dominate the world, Wallace countered that. And he said the 20th century must be the century of the common man. And he called for a worldwide people's revolution. He said we have to end the colonialism, end uh, imperialism, end economic exploitation, spread the fruits of science and industry all over the planet. And, and he said the U.S. and the Soviets have got to play the leading role in creating that future. Wallace was enormously popular, but he had a lot of enemies. His enemies included the Southern segregationists, because he was a leading spokesperson for black civil rights. They included the misogynists, because he was a leading spokesperson for women's rights. They included the business community, because he was a leading spokesperson for labor rights. They included the British and the French, because he was a leading critic of British and French colonialism. Wallace actually said that America's fascists are those people who think that Wall Street comes first and the American people come second. Now we call them Democrats and Republicans, but Wallace got it right. Those were America's fascists. And so when Roosevelt was running for re-election for a fourth term in 1944, the party bosses ganged up on him and said, we want Wallace off the ticket. They called it Pauli's coup. The Treasury the Secretary, Edwin Pauli, uh, after whom Pauli Pavilion is named. Pauli is, was the treasurer of the party, California oil millionaire, who said, I went into politics when I realized it was cheaper to, to elect a new Congress than to buy up the old one. He later gets indicted. Uh, but Pauli runs this coup to try to get Wallace off the ticket. The problem was that Wallace was the second most popular man in America. And the night that the Democratic Convention started, July 20th, 1944, uh, Gallup releases a poll in which they ask potential voters who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman as vice president. 65% said they wanted Henry Wallace. Well, how are the party bosses going uh, to control the convention to get Truman on the ticket and not Wallace? They had the whole thing fixed from the beginning. But that night, uh, Wallace made the seconding speech, the opening night, the seconding speech for Roosevelt. The place went wild in a spontaneous demonstration. It went on for almost an hour. In the middle of it, Senator Claude Pepper from Florida realized that if he could get to the microphone and get Wallace's name and nomination that night, they would defy the bosses and sweep the convention and get Wallace back on the ticket. Pepper fought his way through the crowd. He starts getting close to the microphone. Mayor Kelly and the other bosses see what's going on. They start screaming, adjourn this convention immediately. There's a fire hazard. Sam Jackson was chairing it, had orders not to let Wallace get nominated. And he said, I have a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. A small number of people say aye. All, all opposed say nay. Everybody booms out nay. He says, motion carried, meeting adjourned. Pepper was literally five feet from the microphone. Had Pepper gotten five more feet to the microphone, Wallace would have been back on the ticket as vice president, become president on April 12, 1945, instead of Harry Truman. There would have been no atomic bombings in World War II and very possibly no Cold War. Wallace was the exact opposite of, of Truman in every way. He stays on in the cabinet for Roosevelt as Secretary of Commerce. And from that position, he wages a fight against Truman's Cold War policies and nuclear policies for more than a year from inside as Secretary of Commerce until Truman fires him in September 1946. But Wallace is one of the great voices of American democracy who's been lost to history. The other thing that's most appalling, perhaps the most appalling thing about the atomic bombings in 1945, it was not simply that they killed hundreds of thousands of innocent people, overwhelmingly women and children, but that Truman knowingly set the United States on a glide path to ending all life on the planet. Truman was told, writes in his memoirs that the first day he was briefed on the bomb on April 13th, 
Jimmy Burns flew up from South Carolina and told him that this was not just a more powerful weapon we were developing, but as Truman writes in his memoirs, a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Truman got a similar briefing on April 25th from Secretary of War Stimson and General Groves, and again comments that maybe we shouldn't use this because it could destroy the world. At, at Potsdam, Truman got word of how incredibly powerful the bomb test at Alamogordo was, the Trinity test. And he writes in his journal that night, he says, uh, we've discovered the most terrible weapon in history. This may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Truman understood this was not just a bigger bomb, a more powerful bomb. He said this is the fire, potentially the fire destruction. This could end all life on the planet. Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific head of the Los Alamos Laboratory during the Manhattan Project, understood this too, as did Leo Szilard and many other scientists. Oppenheimer briefed policymakers on May 31st at the interim committee meeting, May 31st, 1945, that within three years we would likely have weapons up to 7,000 times as powerful as the bomb that was going to be dropped at Hiroshima. The policymakers, the leaders knew that. In fact, in 1954, under Project Sundial, American leaders were actually contemplating building a single bomb that was 700,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. There was science, the scientists testified at congressional hearings about this. The insanity of the nuclear arms race was that by the mid-80s, really by the late 60s, but then again by the mid-80s, we had the equivalent of about 1.5 million Hiroshima bombs. 70,000 weapons, 1.5 million Hiroshima bombs. We even contemplated building one bomb that was going to be half of that alone. So this was a period of absolute insanity that we were dealing with. Many people think that with the end of the Cold War, the nuclear threat disappeared. Somehow it, it was abated. That's not true at all. I see among the young people a lot of concern about global warming and climate change, which is admirable. But I also see that the nuclear threat has dropped off of their radar. The reality right now is that the United States is in a very dangerous confrontation and very provocative, provoking Russia and China in ways that are dangerous, unnecessary, and counterproductive. The Americans knew or should have known that this policy toward Ukraine of trying to bring Ukraine into the European Western camp and breaking it off from Russia, the, Soviet, the Russians were going to respond just the way they did. It was totally predictable in the same sense that the provocation in Afghanistan was totally, Brzezinski was, was thrilled in 1979 when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and deliberately provoked that and says, great, now we've given the Soviets their own Vietnam. We weren't upset about that. We were glad about that. The same thing happened with the Soviet intervention following the coup that occurred in Ukraine. And so, uh, the, the Russian intervention following the coup that occurred in Ukraine. So uh, Putin's behavior was totally predictable there. Ukraine represents fundamental national security interests to Russia. There is no way they're going to allow the United States to simply move in and take over. Uh, and, and because what the U.S. was demanding was that the Ukrainians link themselves to the Western camp. In fact, you have to put this in the, in the context. You have to see this through the eyes of the Russians. In 1990, when Gorbachev gave permission to unify Germany, he was promised by the Bush administration, the George H.W. Bush administration, that NATO would not expand one, one thumb's width to the east. What has NATO done? It has expanded, taken in 12 more countries, including former parts of, former parts of the Soviet Union. It has expanded right up to Russia's doorstep. Under George W. Bush, we considered actually incorporating Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. The U.S. policy on Russia's border has been very provocative, increasing NATO troop commitments, military exercises, bringing the uh, missile defense facilities onto Romanian soil, promising to do so on Polish soil by 2018.
This to Russia is a complete provocation. U.S. policy, if we look at it through Russian eyes, has been a series of provocations uh, ever since 1918, but certainly since the end of the Cold War. It's a very, very dangerous game that we're playing. We're also playing a dangerous game with China. In November of 2011, Hillary Clinton wrote an article in Foreign Policy magazine titled America's Pacific Century. And she says we've got to rebalance, we've got to pivot. We've got to forget about the Middle East, which is becoming less and less relevant to the United States, and focus our attention on Asia, because China represents the major threat to the United States now. And so what Obama has done, uh, in conjunction with Clinton, is to not only reposition, rebalance America's forces to the Pacific, but it's to increase arms sales to all of the countries surrounding China. It's basically the same kind of containment policy that the United States had toward the Soviet Union during the Cold War we've had toward China in recent years. So we're selling arms to all those countries. We're conducting joint military exercises with those countries. We're acting very provocatively. And how is China responding? They're responding with their own kind of uh, belligerence and saying they're not going to back down. So they're developing these uh, bases on, on these uh, strips in the uh, South China Sea. Uh, they're, they're, they're accepting their own hard line. This is a disastrous policy. We're heading toward confrontation with both Russia and China. And uh, whereas we, there's enough resources in the East China Sea and the South China Sea to be shared. But China, unfortunately, is following in the footsteps of the British Empire and the American Empire and then, then ex and accepting and, and enacting some of the same kinds of zero-sum game belligerency that, uh, that, that has messed up the world so badly under the American Empire. You look at the world now. What are the fruits of the American Empire, the Pax Americana? Now, the richest 62 people in the world have more wealth than the poorest 3.6 billion. The American empire has been, in many ways, a disaster for humanity. The, the wars, the United States, since 1980, has been militarily involved, bombed, invaded uh, 14 different Islamic countries in recent years, time and time again. Uh, so this has been a, a very, very dangerous policy. To continue this policy of confrontation with Russia and China spells the possibility of a new confrontation and the new possibility of war. And what do we know about nuclear war? We know that even a limited nuclear war between Pakistan and India, and we came very close to that a little bit more than a decade ago, a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan, which 100 nuclear weapons were used. You have to remember that we've got about 15,000 still in the world, but one in which even 100 nuclear weapons were used. The estimate is that that could kill up to 2 billion people and cause partial nuclear winter that would last for a decade. Do people have any understanding of what would happen if there was a larger scale nuclear war? The likelihood of full scale nuclear winter and the ending of all life on the planet would realize the, the, process, the policy that Truman put into effect back in 1945 with the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It would bring down the final curtain, uh, not only on mankind, but all life on the planet. Well, that doomsday clock they talk about was not designed in heaven. The time was set at seven minutes to midnight and 47. Many near catastrophes have come along the way. Now climate change is ticking several seconds off each.